Welcome to Gunsmoke Theater. I'm Dennis Daly. Very few radio or television programs had such an impact on their medium that they changed everything. One of those shows was Gunsmoke. Yes, it ran 20 years on television, but the TV show was a child of the radio show, which itself ran nearly a decade. Sit back now for the next hour as we go back into the archives and play some of those great episodes of the show that changed everything, Gunsmoke. We move to October 1955 and an interesting era for the cast and crew of Gunsmoke and Gunsmoke listeners. Matt Dillon, uh, excuse me, William Conrad had mentioned a couple weeks prior that Gunsmoke would now be seen on television. But people who tuned in to the TV version of Gunsmoke saw people portraying the cast of Gunsmoke with unfamiliar voices. You see, when the decision was made to go to television, it wasn't William Conrad, Parley Bear, Howard McNear, and Georgia Ellis. Four new people played in the cast. Apparently, it was a shock to those in radio. And William Conrad had lost an enormous amount of weight to look good on television. But it just didn't happen. But now Americans could see and hear two different gun smokes every week. One on radio, one on TV. And so, two episodes from radio, from October 1955. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield, made the modern way with Accuray, smoother, cooler, best for you. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Most people think of Dodge City here in the 1870s as a wild, lawless town, swamped with exciting women and strong, daring men. The men they picture as fighters, the kind who stand up for almost no reason at all and gun each other down with as little regard for their own lives as they have for their opponents. Men whose courage is as raw and harsh as the prairies it's bred on. Well, this is the picture. But it isn't quite complete. We got our share of cowards, too. Like the one whose work I ran into the night I found a note on my door. Said, come up to Doc Adams' office as fast as I could. Doc's in the back room, Mr. Dillon. That's the trouble, Chester. He's got Jack Massey in there. Jack Massey? That cowboy who looks up whenever he comes to town, you remember him? He always comes into the office and sits around and talks. Oh, the red-headed fellow, you mean? Huh? It's been six months since we've seen him. Oh, what's he doing up here? What's wrong? Well, Doc, you better ask him. Hello, Matt. Doc? Well, he's dead. Oh, that poor fellow. As soon as I saw him, I knew he couldn't make it. Not with a hole like that in him. Doc, would you mind telling me what happened? Somebody shot him, Matt. 
Well, who shot him? We don't know. I was coming down the street, Mr. Dillon, and I heard a shot, and I run in and found him laying there on the floor, right where he fell out of the chair. Out of what chair, Chester? Why, yours. Mine? Yes, sir, down in the office. He was waiting for you, I guess, and somebody sneaked in the back way and shot him. But why? He was shot in the back. So? Well, he was sitting in your chair, and we noticed he was wearing a hat just like the one you wear. And also, he's about the same size as you. Somebody's out to kill you, Matt. To kill you the easy way. Chesterfield's best for you. They satisfy. If you want tomorrow's better cigarette today, next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. You'll notice how fresh and good Chesterfield's made with Accuray taste, how smooth they are, and how they satisfy. So buy Chesterfield today. Smoother, cooler. Best for you. branch this time of night? Oh, just looking around, Kitty. Well, there are a lot of men at the bar over there. You think you can pick him out? What? The man who thought he shot you tonight. He was travels fast, doesn't he? I heard somebody was after you two days ago. You did? I figured it for talk. Didn't anybody tell you about it? Well, I haven't been around much the last couple of days, Kitty, but... Even so, I guess it isn't the kind of talk people feel easy about passing on. <laughs> to me, anyway. I guess not. You know who started it? He did. Who? Coming this way. What? Well, that's Ed Eby. What's he doing in Dodge? You ought to drop around more often, Matt. He's been banking faro here three or four days now. Has Sam hire him? Yeah. He's been doing fine, too. Eby always was a smart gambler. Hello, Marshal. Miss Kitty. Ed. Hello, Eby. You mind if I sit down? No, go ahead. I uh, been meaning to come see you, Marshal. Oh, is that so? I heard about the shooting tonight. Seems most everybody has. I know something about it, Marshal. Would you like to hear? Tell me. Well, a couple of nights ago, I went out back to breathe a little fresh air. And I was standing out there in the dark around the corner in the alley. And I heard a couple of men come out. They couldn't see me and I couldn't see them, but I heard one of them tell the other he was going to shoot Marshal Dillon. Shoot him any way he could. Uh-huh. You're a little late telling me, aren't you, Evie? I don't exactly owe you no favors, Marshal. Then why did you bother to tell me at all? Because I don't like killing. That's why I hate killing. I've told you everything I know, Marshal. I'll be going now. What's that all about, Matt? What's between you and Evie? Oh, I knew him out in Santa Fe one time, Kitty. He was bullying a man, and I showed him up to be a coward. A lot of people witnessed it. And E.B. never forgave me. Well, then maybe his story's a lie. Maybe he's the one who did the shooting. Tonight. I don't think Ed E.B. has the guts to shoot a man. 
Even in the back. Well, who is it, then? Haven't you any idea? No. But there are a lot of men who'd like to see me dead. I know. I'd be willing to take my chances with anybody who'd face me. It's the man who shoots out of the dark I'm afraid of. Nobody wants to die. But it's even worse without a chance to fight back. That's what always made me feel especially bad about a man who broke his neck falling off a saddle or who maybe disappeared in front of a stampede of buffalo or who, like Jack Massey, sitting at my desk, had to take a bullet in the back. That's not dying. That's being slaughtered like a hog in a pen. Robs a man of everything he's lived for. And it made me mad. Made me so mad I lost my sense of caution. Like the night Chester and I were walking up Front Street after supper. If I was in your boots, Mr. Dillon, I'd hie me out on the ferry for a spell. Oh, you would? You bet I would. Out there you can see a man coming a mile off. I don't think he'd like that, Chester. Yeah, I guess you're right. He'd never call you out into the open. Not him. Or them. You think they might need more than one? Might be. Doggone it, Mr. Dillon. Why don't you hire some men to hang around as a sort of a bodyguard? Then nobody would dare try ambushing you. The sooner they try, the better, Chester. Get it over with one way or the other. I wish I was as cool about it as you. I'm not cool, Chester. I'm mad. You sure got a funny way of showing it. Now, if I was mad, I'd be hopping around like a bronco with a burr under its tail. I'd be a slouching and slouching with foam on my mouth. Get on, Chester. He's up there in the alley. Yeah, I'm going after him. I'm going with you. You stay here. No, by golly, not this time. No, sir. Start shooting, mister. Start shooting while you got a chance. I sure will. He's by that barrel, Mr. Dillon. He's leaning on it. Yeah, I see him. I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you good. Drop that gun. <laughs> Right up to him, Mr. Dillon, and he had a gun right in his hand. He's drunk, Chester. Did you knock him out? Well, I hit him hard enough. Let's get him up to docks. We'll sober him up and find out what this is all about. Don't put that cup down yet, fella. Not before you drink every drop of coffee in it. Ah. Uh... I'm drowning in coffee, Doc. I said drink it. Yeah, there. No more, Doc. I'm sober now. Yes, well. Matt. Yeah, Doc. He can talk straight now. It's about time. What's your name, mister? Nat Swan. But I didn't mean nothing, Marshal. I didn't know what I was doing. Honest, I didn't. And I'll tell you. You were trying to kill me. No. No, don't. Don't hit me. Don't hit me. Uh, you're a real coward, aren't you, Swan? Even to shoot me in the back, you had to take on a load of whiskey. I got nothing against you, Marshal. I come to town and heard all that talking and thought I could make a name for myself if I'd done the shooting. <laughs> Ain't no more to it than that. Oh, listen, no more to it than that. Oh. Well, nothing personal is what I mean. I should have put strychnine in that coffee. What are you saying, Doc? Never mind, Doc. I believe you, Swan. Oh, you do? Well, it's true. Honest, it is. Yeah, it's true, all right. And there are a lot of other drunken, brainless bums going to try it for the same reason. They've heard somebody's out to murder me, and they got to thinking, why shouldn't they do it and get the credit for themselves? Well, no, man, no, it's not that bad. It's already started, Doc. And there will be others. Lots of them. As long as I last. Listen. 
listen to an electronic miracle. This electronic miracle, Accuray, means that everything from auto tires to apple pie, battleship steel to baby food, butter to cigarettes, can be made better and safer for you. Now meet Mr. Bert Choke, brilliant young president of industrial nucleonics. Well, Bert, exactly what is Accuray? Well, George, it is a device by which a stream of electrons passes through and analyzes the product while it is actually being made. They transmit what they see to this electronic brain, which adjusts the production machinery for errors down to millionths of an inch. One more question, one that so many people ask me. How does Accuray make Chesterfield a better cigarette than was ever possible before? Every cigarette made with Accuray control contains a more precise measure of perfectly packed tobaccos. So Chesterfield smokes smoother, without hot spots or a hard draw. And that's why Chesterfield tastes so much better. And I guess that's why you smoke them yourself, Bert. You see, I know what Accuray can do. Well, there's your answer. If you want tomorrow's better cigarette today, next time, stop. Remember. Only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. Best for you. Chester and I rode Nat Swan down to the Arkansas. Told him to get his horse across and to keep going. I guess he thought I was about to shoot him the way he rode off, all hunkered up in the saddle, trying to look small. And I was pretty sure he'd never show up and dodge again. Now yeah, that'd be one less glory hunter to deal with. But the thought of how many were left waiting in the alleys, hiding in the shadows, well, it made me jumpy. But I didn't realize how bad off I was until we got back into town rode into the stable. We put our horses into their stalls and we're walking toward the door. This barn's plumb deserted tonight, Mr. Dunn. It's late, Chester. Everybody's either drunk or in bed by now. Well, there's somebody who ain't. Hey, what's he doing with that rifle? Here, duck into the stall, Chester. You've seen us. All right, drop the rifle, mister. Not likely. Drop it, I say. No! He's going to shoot. You got him. You stay back, Chester. Don't shoot. Don't shoot again. Pick up his rifle, Chester. I got it. At last you, mister. You put a bullet in my lung. Who are you? I've never seen him before. Why do you care who I am? You've got to kill a mess, what you did. Why were you after me? Somebody hire you? Tell me. You shoot a man down, and then you try to blame it on him. Maybe he wasn't after you. I ain't after nobody. I come for my horse, that's all. I think he's telling the truth, Mr. Dillon. Dillon? You... You're the marshal. Well, who did you think I was? I heard talk somebody was out to shoot you. It wasn't me. I was just trying to get home to Texas. I ain't gonna make it now. Well, I... I heard you lever your rifle, mister. You... You are about to shoot. I thought I was being held up. The way you hollered at me... Oh, my goodness, Mr. Dillon. He ain't got nothing to do with this. Of course I ain't. If I was you, Marshal, if there's talk about somebody after me, I'd find out who's making the talk. I wouldn't go around shooting innocent people. Somebody's got you outsmarted. We'll get you up to docks, Mr. Hill. Take good care of you. Mm. Don't, don't bury me in a blanket, Marshal. Fix me a box, will you? Promise me you'll fix me a box. Yeah. Yeah, I promise. 
I can't swallow no more. I'm going to drop, drown. <laughs> I killed an innocent man, Chester. Well, he'd have shot you if you hadn't, Mr. Brown. They don't even know his name. But we'll fix him a box. We'll fix him a good one. Yes, sir. And I'm going to do something else, he said. What's that? I've been outsmarted. He was right. But I know what I'm doing now. Kitty. You're looking for somebody. You bet I am. Trouble? Now the trouble's over. Now it soon will be. If there's going to be a fight, they don't need me in this saloon. I'd be mighty surprised if there is a fight, Kitty. Huh? Cowards don't carry guns. Ed Evie. I'll see you later. You come to split, gentlemen. You care to string along? Well, Marshal Dillon, you going to try your luck? My luck ran out about an hour ago, Evie. What? I shot and killed an innocent man. What are you talking about, Marshal? You were too cheap to hire somebody to get me, Evie, and too much of a coward to try it yourself. I don't like that. Your story about overhearing that talk out back. You spread it around, hoping it'd give some brainless fool the idea to try it himself. Now, that's a lie. Two men tried it. And they made me so jumpy, I just killed a man I thought was going to try it again. Well, I feel pretty bad about that, Evie. I got nothing to do with it. You told me the story thinking it'd make you look innocent. Now, you outsmarted me, Evie. For a while. You can't prove any of this. I don't have to. Now, come on. You can't arrest me? No. And I'm going to lock you up, and tomorrow I'm going to run you out of town. No. Two innocent men have died because of your cowardice, Evie. I wish I could hang you for it. Don't you call me a coward. You're the worst coward I ever saw. Shut up. You stop saying it. You're doing just what you did out in Santa Fe. Come on, Evie. I'll show you I'm not a coward. You won't call me that anymore. Take your hand out of your pocket, Evie. I got a gun in here. I'll kill you myself. No, you won't. You're not going to draw that gun. Yes, I am. Not you, Evie. I'll do it. Not you, Evie. I'll kill you. Just keep talking, Evie. Keep talking. Why didn't you shoot him, Matt? You had a right to. I think he wanted me to, Kitty. What? I think he'd rather be dead than face everybody knowing what a coward he is. Well, he's got his punishment coming. For the rest of his life. Remember, only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. Smoother, cooler, best for you. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Ray Kemper. 
Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, John Daner, and Jack Edwards. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. This is it. L and M, superior taste and filter. L and M, America's best filter tip cigarette. Be sure and listen to Gunsmoke again on radio next week at the same time. Transcribed for Chesterfield. so often during this 52-part retrospective looking at Gunsmoke Radio, I've thanked Don Aston. You've likely heard Don. He's been on old-time radio for years, talking about those great shows, and what you may not know is that he is largely responsible for the fact we have the Gunsmoke shows we do. He spent a lot of time and effort and money finding the shows that were available, and many of them are in incredible quality. That's the great thing about the really good quality gun smokes we've been able to find, and thanks again, Don, because they sound live and they give us a feel of what it was really like to have listened to that show in the 1950s when it was on radio on CBS. Now another episode from the fall of 1955. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield, made the modern way with Accuray, smoother, cooler, best for you. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Time for a drink? Well, I'll go with you, Doc. Good, good. And the long branch is closest. 
Let's go in there. Okay. <laughs> Some people say it doesn't look good for a doctor to be seen in a saloon. Especially in the daytime. Oh, then you believe it too? Oh, no, no, not me. I, I look on doctors as almost human. Almost? Oh, oh you're almost human. Well, well, that's mighty charitable of you. I'll think of that the next time you come crawling around with your throat cut or, or with a bullet in you. You'll feel better when you get your drink, Doc. Yeah, I'll feel better when I talk to Kitty. <laughs> Hello, Doc. Matt. Hello, Kitty. It's a pleasure to see you, Kitty. It's a real pleasure. Well, thanks, Doc. <laughs> Sam, a bottle and two glasses. Okay, Doc. <laughs> I'm buying the lady a drink. You sure you haven't had enough already, Doc? Oh, now, just because you're not used to men who act like Jim. <laughs> I think he's talking about me, Kitty. Yeah, I figured that. What have you two been arguing about this time? Oh, we don't have been working up to an argument, Kitty. Well, there's somebody else here who seems to be doing that. Oh? Huh? A cowboy at the end of the bar. Oh, what about him? I heard him telling Sam he's got a pack horse outside, loaded with ammunition. Well, there's no harm in that, is there? He said it's to kill Kansans with, Doc. Well, what did he mean, Kitty? I don't know, Matt. But he's awful mad about something. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, no, no. Be careful. Be careful. Hello. My name's Dillon. I'm the marshal here. My name is Jim Hoyt, and I wish I'd never heard of Kansas. Oh, where are you from, Hoyt? Dina River. Texas, huh? Texas. You staying here long? Long enough to finish this drink. And since you're so nosy, I'll tell you. I'm with nine other Texans. We got 2,000 head of cattle six days' drive from here. They're branded Cross R and Jack Raven's Trail Boss. Anything else you want to know? Yeah, there's something else. Have all of the men in that outfit got their backs up like you have? Don't you worry none about us, Marshal. We'll handle things. With all that ammunition they sent you for? What's going on down there, anyway? Nothing a few Texans can't take care of. Why don't you want to tell me about it, Hoyt? Because I don't trust you no more than I trust any Kansan. Then why don't you finish your drink? Because I'm going to ride back with you. is best for you they satisfy if you want tomorrow's better cigarette today next time you buy cigarettes stop remember only chesterfield is made the modern way with accuray you'll notice how fresh and good chesterfield's made with accuray taste how smooth they are and how they satisfy so buy chesterfield today smoother cooler Best for you. Jim Hoyt didn't like it much, but I got Chester and we saddled up and rode south with him. Nobody said a word the whole day. And that night, Chester and I spelled each other, keeping awake so as Hoyt wouldn't slip out on us. He knew what we were doing, and of course he just stretched out on the ground and enjoyed a good night's rest. It was late the next afternoon, soon after we'd crossed the Cimarron, that we ran into the Cross R herd, bedding down for the night. We rode around it, up to the chuck wagon fire, and dismounted. 
Jack Raven's a trail boss, Marshal, and that's him leaning against that wagon studying. Now, yeah, let's go talk to him, Chester. And you tell him how you got here so he'll know who to get mad at. I'll do that, Hoyt. Well, them's the first word Hoyt said in the last ten miles. I guess he's been saving his strength. What for? I don't know. Maybe the boss here will tell us. Yeah, if he don't shoot us first, he looks down on you unfriendly to me. Jack Raven? That's me. My name's Matt Dillon. This is Chester Proudfoot. I do. Howdy. I'm a U.S. Marshal, Raven. Dodge? Uh huh. This your first time up the trail? First time for any of it. Now, Jim Hoyt didn't tell me much. He didn't want me down here at all. And why'd you come? I got curious about that ammunition you sent him to Dodge for. Some law against it? Now, that depends on what you aim to use it for. We aim to kill Kansans with it, Marshal. Uh-huh. You got any particular Kansans in mind? I ain't particular. You told me that's your first trip up here, the first trip for any of you, huh? What's that got to do with it? You lost many cattle? I've lost all I'm going to. How many? Some 20, 30 head. Stampede? Two of them. How'd they get started? Men? Men out there waving blankets they set fire to in the night. And they wasn't Indians, neither. We seen them, but we couldn't chase them or go shooting at them, or we'd have lost the whole herd. Now, why did you send Hoyt for ammunition? You gonna start shooting next time? We're short of ammunition, Marshal. Next time it happens, we thought maybe we'd some of us take off a few days to do a little hunting. I see. I want to get this herd to Dodge. I want to get it sold. Then we're riding back this way. And shoot anybody you come across, is that it? Well, like I said, I ain't particular, Marshal. Not about Kansans, I ain't. Tell me something, Raven. Did you ever hear of Jayhawkers? No. They're outlaws, Raven. They're murderers, criminals. They're men who started riding on the Missouri border during the war, and they got the taste of blood in their mouths. Now it's like they got no place to go. So they're out after anything in sight. They cause a lot of trouble. And why don't you stop them? We try. Don't forget the ordinary Kansan hates jayhawkers as much as you do. But what do they want? What goods it do them to stampede my herd? You'll find out what they want. They'll let you know. I want to stay here to help you when they do. I don't know whether I trust you or not. Well, I guess you'll have to find that one out too, Raven. Yeah, I'll find it out. I got work to do now. I don't know if the cook will feed any Kansas men, but you can go ask him. Chester. It's almost daylight. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> then I guess we better get up. I declare I didn't hear a thing all night. I slipped right through. Well, if it'd been a stampede, you'd have heard it, Chester. Maybe them Jayhawkers has uh, quit. Uh, maybe. Mr. Dillon. Yeah, what? Look yonder, riding that horse. That's Jim Hoyt. Well, where's his clothes? And look, he's all bloodied up. They're having to help him get down off his horse. There's Jack Raven. Yeah. What in the world do you suppose happened? He didn't get those marks on his back from a fall. Take a look at Jim Hoyt, Marshal. Take a good look. Where'd they catch you, Hoyt? How come you know anybody caught me, Marshal? That's a good question. How do you know? This has happened before. It's one of their methods. Filthy Kansas. Jayhawkers. Mighty Raven. fancy name for a bunch of murdering devils. You were on guard and they sneaked up on you. Is that the way it they happened? They stripped me and flogged me. Didn't they give them a message for me? They want money, huh? I got 2,000 head of cattle, Marshal. 
If I pay them jayhawkers two dollars a head, they say there won't be no more trouble. By sundown. They want that money by sundown. You gonna pay it, Raven? I'd rather lose a whole herd. We'll ride guard in pairs tonight. There won't be any more beatings. And I hope there's no shooting. Them cattle are ready to run most anything by now. We'd like to ride with you, Raven. I might trust you, Marshal. I don't know. But the men wouldn't. They'd never stand for it. All right. So we're going to be around. We're not leaving here. And you better keep pretty close to camp. You might get yourself killed if you stray very far. Listen. Listen to an electronic miracle. This electronic miracle, Accuray, means that everything from auto tires to apple pie, battleship steel to baby food, butter to cigarettes, can be made better and safer for you. Now meet Mr. Bert Choke, brilliant young president of industrial nucleonics. A word exactly what is Accuray? Well, George, it is a device by which a stream of electrons passes through and analyzes the product while it is actually being made. They transmit what they see to this electronic brain, which adjusts the production machinery for errors down to millionths of an inch. One more question, one that so many people ask me. How does Accuray make Chesterfield a better cigarette than was ever possible before? Every cigarette made with Accuray control contains a more precise measure of perfectly packed tobaccos. So Chesterfield smokes smoother, without hot spots or a hard draw. And that's why Chesterfield tastes so much better. I guess that's why you smoke them yourself, Bert. You see, I know what Accuray can do. Well, there's your answer. If you want tomorrow's better cigarette today, next time, stop. Remember. Only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. Best for you. I took Raven's advice, and Chester and I stayed with a chug wagon all that day. But when the herd was bedded down about dusk, we saddled up and rode out of camp. Raven had his men standing guard by twos, all right. And he had the herd lying in a plane that apparently nobody could approach without being seen a mile or so off. We scouted the land all dark. And just as the moon was coming up, we found what I'd been hoping for. A deep gully about a half a mile from the herd. The contour of the land made it difficult to see unless you were almost on top of it. And I picked it as the most likely approach the jayhawkers had used. We hit our horses at the bottom and then climbed back out. That's an awful long gully, Mr. Dillon. Uh, Them jayhawkers could ride out of it most anywhere for a mile or so. Yeah, they could, Chester, but right in here is where it's closest to the herd. Oh, we better lie down. Next time. You know, I've been thinking, Mr. Dillon, there's only two of us. Might go hard if we have to shoot it out with maybe a dozen men. And well, I'm hoping there won't be any shooting at all. Yeah, well, most half a mile from that herd, that ought to bother him very much. It would bother him. Like Raven said, those cattle are ready to run at anything. Well, if we can't shoot, how are we going to stop them jayhawkers? Well, most of the kind are cowards, Chester. If we surprise them, maybe we can scare them into dropping their guns. You believe that? <laughs> well, I'm gambling on it anyway. If we start a stampede by getting into a gun battle over here, those Texans aren't going to treat us any better than they would the Jayhawkers. They sure are a hard-headed lot, ain't they? Yeah, they got some cause to be, Chester. Well, they got no cause to be. Shh. 
Listen. Somebody in the gulch. They're right down there, Mr. Dillon. I'll come climb it out in a minute. Not if we're on top of them. Come on. Don't do any shooting unless I do, huh? No, I won't. Quiet now. What's going on? Oh, no. Too much moon to ride over there. We'll stampede them from here. All we got to do is spread out along this gulch and start shooting. Uh -huh. It don't matter whether you hit cows or Texans. <laughs> now let's spread out a little, Joseph. We'll crawl right up on top of them. All right, you. Come on. No, no. We're a long ways off. We've set up enough rifle fire, them cattle stampede shore. They'll have their hands so full of chasing them, they won't have time to worry us. Yeah, well, I think we're here. You men are covered. Get your hands up. You better do what he says. We're all around you. That's right, man. He'll kill us anyway. No. All right, Chester, give it to him. One of them's getting away, Mr. Dillon. Will we chase him? No, let him go, Chester. We got the other three. He sure did put up a fight, didn't he? Yeah, I kind of misjudge her being cowards and quitting. Listen, listen, listen. Yeah, it's the cattle. We started another stampede after all. Come on, we better go help them. No, they're running the other way. We'd never get anywhere near them. I bet them Texans is going to be mighty mad. Yeah, and mostly at us. <laughs> They left the Jayhawkers right where they died. Rode slowly back to camp. Nobody was there but the cook. So we sat down and waited. We waited three or four hours before any riders showed up. And when they did, they weren't exactly friendly. They stood around at a distance and watched us as though they were guarding a couple of prisoners. Finally, Jim Hoyt walked over to us. It was you done all that shooting, Marshal. Some of it, yeah. I was shooting, too. Well, the men wants to hang you. Oh, is that so? We seen you riding around, didn't know what you was up to, but we sure found out, didn't we, man? All right, now you just look at here. Take There's it easy, four Chester. of us here now. You gonna put up a fight? I don't blame you for being mad, Hoyt. Now the rest of you. But that's no excuse to be talking about lynching anymore. We ain't talking, Marshal. We're gonna do it. Sure. Wouldn't you like to know why we were doing the shooting? We know all we need to know. Now unbuckle them guns, both. Use of them. your head, Hoyt. It's Jack Raven. Raven ain't gonna stop us. <laughs> What's going on here? We're about to hang us a couple of Kansans, Raven. Yeah, that's what I figured. Don't aim to have no interference. All right. I don't give you any. Good. I want to tell you something first, though. Say it out. I was kind of curious about it, so I rode over to where those two did all that shooting. You know what I found? Bunch of empty cartridges. I found three dead men, Hoyt, laying in a gully. What? Now, I don't know what these here jayhawkers are supposed to look like, but them three men I found, that's how they ought to look. This for true, Reed? It's true. Well, I guess I've been a little hot-headed. I didn't trust the marshal either. Not at first. Well, then, well, you done our work for us, Marshal. It was you, too. Found them devils and faced them. Ah, oh, forget it, Hoyt. It's over. I don't think you'll be bothered anymore. Say, Marshal, me and Hoyt and the men, uh, well, we've had a bad trip. When we get to Dodge, we'll maybe want to kick up our heels a little. Well, as short of gunplay, Raven, this is one outfit that can hurrah dodge all at once. 
Now, where do you get there? The first bottle's on me. If you want tomorrow's better cigarette today, next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. You'll notice how fresh and good Chesterfield's made with Accuray taste, how smooth they are, and how they satisfy. So buy Chesterfield today. Smoother, cooler, best for you. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Ray Kemper. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. The makers of Chesterfield and l and Filters salute the National Safety Council on their 43rd National Safety Congress, which is being held in Chicago October 17th through October 21st. Make today your big red letter day, your l and red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. This is it. L and M. Superior taste and filter. Superior taste from tobaccos especially selected for filter smoking. Tobaccos that are richer, tastier, light and mild. And L and M's superior filter is white, pure white. Truly the miracle tip. Because when it's added to L&M tobaccos, it actually improves your enjoyment of this great cigarette. Next time you buy cigarettes, look for the big red letters L&M. Smoke L&M filters. America's best filter tip cigarette. Be sure and listen to Gunsmoke again on radio next week at the same time. Transcribed for Chesterfield. difficult for us in a more enlightened time to listen to all the cigarette commercials that permeated radio and early television. Many of the shows were downright owned by the tobacco companies, and all of those great commercials made us think that smoking was healthy. I like the Chesterfield commercials where the announcer asks, Doctor, which cigarette do you smoke? See, there was no question that smoking wasn't downright normal, that everybody smoked. And so the cigarette companies didn't want you to try smoking. They wanted you to try their cigarette. They assumed that everybody smoked, and all they had to do was to convince those already smokers that they needed to switch to a different brand. It's so sad that all of those announcers and all of the people who promoted smoking are no longer around. And that's it for this time around. I'm Dennis Daly. Thanks for joining me on Gunsmoke Theater. 
as we go back into the archives to play more of the episodes of the radio show that changed everything for the better. Gunsmoke, right here on YouTube.